So let me bring them up and please welcome Joel and Evan and Ken. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Joel, Evan. Slide down there. I'll get where I'm supposed to sit. Welcome. Uh, forgive my uh, Twitter-like introduction here, but Evan Williams is the CEO of Twitter. He's on the far right. And Joel Hyatt is the CEO and co-founder with Al Gore of Current TV. Let me begin by asking um, if we've lost it. Um, you guys do a cool and new product. What's significant about it? Who wants to be first? Uh, um, well, I think it depends on for whom you're asking. For Twitter, uh, it's significant for people who use it because it changes how they, how they connect with people, keep on top of information, and, and share thoughts. And um, I think if you expand that to a very large user base, it can change culture. Has it? Uh, well, it's small still. Joe, what's significant? Well, I think that what's significant about what Current's doing, Twitter and others, is that we're changing the paradigms of the media business by enabling consumers and users of media platforms to influence if not even to create uh, the content they consume. And that's a very big deal. Um, uh, and you see it, you know, you see it, it, it current with, with viewer created content or even viewer created ads. You see it in the collaboration that, that we did with, uh, with Twitter uh, on the debates. And it's really a good example. There were a lot of ways you could watch, the, a lot of networks that you could watch the debates on. But all of them had one, one formula. It was the candidates and it was a moderator. Uh, and after that, you had the pleasure of seeing the punditry. Um, you know, really partisan, strident people screaming at each other with a point of view that you, you knew in advance of watching it. You don't and like the best political team on television? I, I don't like the format. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, what, what we were able to do is invite the public into the debates and allow them to engage in the conversation of democracy. And that's what's been missing on the media, and that's what we were able to do collaborating Talk with about what you guys did the other night. You, you collaborated on election night. I think you've got a little short you want to show. Yeah, we, we, we well, with, with Evan's Twitter, we collaborated on the coverage of the four debates, and then we collaborated with Twitter and with Dig um, in a three-way collaboration on election night. Uh, coverage again in which uh, we, we allowed a conversation to take place in every conceivable media format from rich media and video uh, to text to tweets, uh, all of which were, were then put together uh, in a totally unique and creative way that enabled people to participate in the experience, interpret it for uh, the, for their peers uh, and, and participate in what was truly a historic night. Um, we do have a little uh, reel that shows a little bit about both the debate um, coverage uh, and the election day coverage. At least I thought we technology. Did. This is not our technology, by the way. <laughs> I think we should keep talking. <laughs> well, let me ask you an embarrassing question. Uh, each of you. I mean, you. you... Oh, yeah. no, that's the wrong. That's the wrong, that's the wrong reel. That's the wrong reel. Is it? About, uh, yeah. Six Can we cut that Jeanette one? On yeah. Trips, you're scooping our conversation. That, those are our great viewer created ads. You'll have to wait a little bit to see the commercial break. <laughs> it's been fantastic. We hit the road, and I never looked back. That's I don't think anybody's back. listening to us, Ken. That's not back. what we yeah, wanted to show. Um, Can we cut that? Thank you. Okay. So. It, what you're doing is new, and we'll get back to the clip in a, in a second. Uh, but what's not new about Twitter and Current is that you're not making any money. So how are you going to make money? Evan? Um, <laughs> what? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's as big of a dilemma as people seem to think it will be for us. Um, we haven't focused on it yet, and it's, I can't say for sure exactly how it's going to work, but we believe that Twitter is creating a lot of value, both for users and 
in a lot of cases for companies and orga organizations that are using it as a new communications channel uh, that has some unique properties. It has real time, it's one to many, but also has a back channel interactive aspects. And there are all kinds of companies that are using it to do sales, like Dell Outlet, Woot.com, a lot of companies who say, um, who have goods that are scarce and they want to get the word out very quickly. And so people are opting in for that information. People are also opting in for more marketing related messages. And it's a way to keep in touch with, the, with people, but also companies and organizations or brands you care about. And it's sort of natural. It's, it's not a purely social medium. And it also adds value of some of the things we're experimenting with around the election, but could be done for other events to see the aggregate, um, the real-time information that is being produced about any topic or um, event that's coming out. So new camera comes out, you can go to our search site and see what people are saying about it faster than anywhere else. But let me be sure I understand what you're saying. Are you saying that, that uh, build it and they will come? We have a, use, a, really, a product that is useful to many people and we have faith that one day we will be able to monetize it. Well, it's more, <laughs> it, yes, we do have faith, but what I'm focusing on is, is it's more than that because there are purely social communication mechanisms that are, are really valuable to users, but traditionally hard to monetize. I mean, I am an email, for example. Uh, Twitter has some aspects that are much different than that, and if, if you look at how people are actually using it today, there's commercial value, not just personal value. And the commercial value, if there's commercial value and we can really um, deliver on that proposition that many companies are experimenting with with Twitter today, then I don't think it's going to be hard to, to monetize that. Joel? Well, um, we're actually doing very well in terms of financial metrics candidates for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, because we've been focused on business model and revenue model in every aspect of what we're doing, including our leading ed edge innovations. But we're also sitting on top of the foundation of a very old-fashioned and quite attractive business model, and that's the cable satellite television network. So we're now, Current's now carried into 58 million subscriber households uh, in the U.S., U.K., Ireland, and Italy, and we're paid every month on every one of those subscriber households. So that's an old-fashioned business model because uh, it has two revenue streams, the license fees we get from the Comcast and DirecTVs and the advertising revenues we get from our sponsors. And so we launched Current TV in August of 05, and 06, our first full year, we operated profitably on an EBITDA basis. We operated profitably on an EBITDA basis in 07. And that actually has been how we've been able to finance internally all of the new media developments that we're doing. Again, all of them which have uh, uh, advertising revenue model associated with them. And as we continue to innovate, we believe there are other uh, revenue models as well. So. You know, we, we, Al and I actually, you know, began Current over a series of conversations a few years ago um, with a lot of uh, innovative notions about how to unleash the creativity of young adults and empower them to, to be able to share these platforms to communicate uh, and, to, and to create content that they, that they then want to consume. What but, percentage but, 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 but Ken, if I just may on the business model thing, in that, in that series of, of conversations that led to the founding of Current, we came up with a lot of great ideas for which we couldn't find a business model. And so we really turned it on its head and said, look, you know, the media industry has some very attractive business models, let's see if we can find one to which we can then bring massive doses of innovation. Instead of starting with innovation seeking a business model, we started with a business model seeking innovation. So we, we've had, you know, we are revenue generating and, and profit generating and it have been, you know, for a while. So it's a little bit different. And we're applying that same discipline now as we innovate in the new media space so that even the collaboration we did uh, with Twitter uh, and Dig the other night on the election, which was thrown together in the last two or three weeks before the election, it required all kinds of software development, content development, working with Twitter, working with Dig. Fact is, we were able to call Microsoft and said, this is going to go on the air three days. It's going to be really exciting. It's going to be like no one's ever seen. They said, you don't understand. We, there's no way we can get an approval to sponsor anything in three days. We said, well, that's too bad. It'd be a good thing for you. They said, well, tell us about it. We told them about us, and the next day they called and said they were in. Uh, so e even the innovative stuff we're doing is finding revenue model. Let's see. Is it 40% the figure user-generated yes. content? Yes. See if we can do that um, clip now. Which one? The, the one on election night. Do we have that other clip now we can run? 
Hello, everybody. Well, at last, the election's over. Now you have some time to sit back and reflect upon this long journey before the next campaign season starts in a week or so. Current TV turned this election inside out. We got rid of pundits and added perspective. First, we worked with Twitter to hack the debate. Hack the debate was such a success that we brought in Dig to up the ante and do something completely different for our election night coverage. We are going to have to have some leadership from Washington. We've got to enact legislation to fix this. Joe Sixpack, hockey moms across the nation. This is the most important election you will ever, ever have voted in. You will not see one dime's worth of tax increase. I want Joe the plumber to spread that wealth around. This is not the end. So what excites you about that? What you did the, I'm sorry, Evan. Evan, what excites you about what you did the other night? Um, I think it's an, a step toward something that I've been involved with for many years, sort of uh, under the highfalutin term democratization of media. And so I started working on, on blogging almost uh, 10 years ago. and. I really realized that, that the ability for the, the, one of the most profound promises of the internet was giving everybody the, the ability to, to have a voice. And it's, that's sort of mundane now that, because it's, it's well known, but there's a whole nother realm here with, with what Curran is doing. There's two things that, that are new. One is that there's this medium, the biggest medium in America that hasn't been democratized yet, that of television. And um, with, with blogging the last 10 years or so, there's been this great aspect that anything that's published on the web, bloggers can, can offer an alternative viewpoint or an analysis, but it's always kind of after the fact. And now with Twitter and this broadcast model, you can get alternative viewpoints while something is happening. And that's pretty exciting, I think. One of the, the questions that, particularly in light of the recession we're agreed to be in at this moment, is you are reliant, here you are, new media, reliant on a very old model, which is advertising support. Can you imagine each of you other forms of revenue streams going forward, and what form might they take? Evan? Um, yeah. Well. Our, aver our revenue is not necessarily advertising per se. Um, again, we haven't launched anything yet, but what, what we plan to do is, I think advertising, as most people think of it, is, is more and more a difficult proposition. The, the whole idea of we're going to insert some message along with the content that you actually want and hope that you know, you'll be interested in that as well. Uh, Twitter's model is pretty different, where all the, there is commercial activity, as I was saying, but it's entirely opt-in. And people want the commercial information, they'll ask to receive it. It's, and uh, if they don't want it, if it's not offering value, they won't receive it. And so it's much more organic. And we could put advertising within the content they're con that they're consuming, but I don't think we need to do that necessarily. I don't think that's going to be the best benefit for either companies or end users. Uh, I think what we can do is provide a really valuable communication channel and, and charge the people who want to use that communication channel commercially. And it's not advertising as, as you might think of it. Joel? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation uh, across revenue models, whether that be subscription, uh, license fee content rights, whether it be e-commerce applications in addition to, in addition to innovation on the, uh, on the basic advertising revenue stream. Um, I, and I believe that, again, you know, those who stay out at the leading edge of innovating on the business model side as well as on the technology side and the content side are going to be winners as we go forward. When, when you look at how you bumped up against 
traditional media, traditional ways of doing things. What impact, how do you gauge the impact you've had on them? Well, look, we're, we're very proud of Current, uh, you know, in terms of the thought leadership we provided to the industry. When we set out with the notion of user-generated content, no one had ever heard of it. YouTube didn't exist. I mean, Facebook, none of those companies existed. And the television, you know, experience was a completely closed system controlled by a small oligopoly with one-way communication into people's homes. And the only choice and control you had, which was really none, was you could pick up your remote control if you didn't like what you watch and flick to another network over which, again, you had absolutely no influence except to decide whether you wanted to change to something else over which you had no influence. And the idea of sharing the power of that incredibly powerful but closed system with the audience and with users was totally revolutionary. Now many, many of the features that we innovated in fulfillment of that strategic vision have been copied by media companies all over the United States and indeed all over the world. And we feel, we're delighted about that. And whereas user-generated content was a new idea then and one that you know people really kind of scoffed at. It is today ubiquitous and pervasive and taken for granted. So we're 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 awful pleased that that um, you know from CNN to MTV to CBS to ABC, whoever you want to name, we can point to specific features they've taken right off of current, and that's part of what we set out to do is provide that thought leadership. Evan, how do you gauge your impact on other media? Um, well, I think we're we're both part of the, that same movement, and uh, that has been the, the mainstream media companies have realized uh, that there's value in tapping into to people's voices for, for a number of years, and they're all trying to do stuff. They're all kind of desperately trying to do stuff now. And for Twitter, it's been really interesting, the, the uptake we've gotten really recently, if you watch CNN in the last couple months, of, about the election coverage, they're turning to Twitter on a daily basis. It's it's in a number of television shows where the, they'll go to the Twitters. Uh, it was on the homepage of Newsweek.com the other day. They had a little Twitter box. It's on um, tons of sites where they're either referring to Twitter or getting data from Twitter. Even even uh, in less obvious ways, there are lots of reporters who are getting information from Twitter or or going to Twitter to see what trends are happening right now because because the the buzz is very it's very immediate and there's um, major news organizations who are are watching our trend data and trying to figure out news stories before they hit the wire because of what's happening or what what the people are are talking about. Joel, you you talk about user generated and the other video we have. Let's see it. It's about user-generated advertising. Right. In addition to innovating on viewer-created content, we extended that proposition to our sponsors and our advertisers on the theory that viewer-created ads would be far more uh, authentic, far more realistic, and indeed they've become content and programming instead of advertising, and we're able to now show our advertisers, Ken, that our viewers prefer viewer created ads nine to one over the Madison Avenue ad. So here's just a, a examples of that. We queue up that um, the next video. I feel like I'm back in New York. <laughs> let me let me. It'll come at some point, but let, let's move on. Evan, let me ask you a question. There is an argument that some might make that when people are twittering their friends all day long, I'm going to the bathroom now. Or I'm I'm about to have dinner. Um, that they feel like they're familiar with what their friends are doing, but you lose the intimacy that you have with conversation. How would you respond to that? Um, well, I would say, first of all, Twitter is not a replacement for uh, human contact. But um, I know it's not meant to be, but is it possible it becomes one? I, I suppose it is for some people that are dysfunctional anyway, but <laughs> I mean, Twitter in a lot of ways does the opposite. It, it adds intimacy because one of the, if, you're, if you live with a person or with a person on a daily basis, you know lots of mundane things about them. And if you don't see a person very often, you catch up on the big stuff when you talk to them. And 
But there could be someone who's very close to you, a family member or an old friend who happens to live across the country. And we hear constantly from people who have now connected with that, that type of a friend like that or over Twitter, and now the relationship is much more intimate because they're getting these little details throughout the day. Um, and you know, people will share what they're comfortable sharing, but it doesn't have to be profound stuff. It can be like, when I went to the DMV because my car got you know, the, the boot or something. And it's stuff that you wouldn't normally share when you're doing the once a month phone call, which is even you know, hard to keep up with, at least with, with for me and calling my mom. But if, if you can share this stuff throughout the day and then it, it's a compliment and you feel closer the whole time and then you can catch up in face to face or on the phone and it, it adds intimacy. It does the opposite, I think, of what, what you suggest. Joe, one of the concerns that, that people in journalism have, and I assume it was yours when you talked about one of the reasons that you started Current was you worried about size and, 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 and the de-emphasis on things like investigative reporting. Do you see Current filling that void of, of the kind of investigative reporting that television has been missing? Well, well we certainly see Current playing a small part in that and hopefully a, a, a part that grows in its importance. We have a vanguard journalism team that is traveling the world telling stories no one else is telling and telling them in ways no one's telling them. And we have a collective journalism program which allows citizen journalists from all over the world to participate in some of the stories that we're developing. And I think, Ken, that you've hit on, on a really, really important societal point. I mean, we used to have a journalism profession and then it became the news business and then that morphed into part of the media industry and that's now all owned by conglomerates and you know as well as I talking to people who started off as professional journalists how that metamorphosis ended up changing what it is they do and how it is they're privileged and empowered to do it in ways that are not uh, not positive for a vibrant strong democracy and, and so we think that, again, opening up these closed systems, unleashing creativity, empowering people to share their stories, tell their stories, pursue their passions, and then be able to have access to the media platforms uh, to share those stories is very, very important. And citizen journalism is already proven, whether it's in the Katrinas or you know, in other momentous events where the news media is not you know, have access to on the spot, it's proven to, 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 to be enormously useful and valuable to getting important you know, information out to the world. I hear we have that video. So here's, here comes a commercial break with some viewer created ads, I think. Hi, I'm Eugene. This is Jeanette. We've been in a relationship for about uh, six months. You know, Jeanette likes to go on road trips. We like to go camping. We like to go out in the country. She is perfect. I'm not gonna lie. It's been, it's been fantastic. We hit the road, and I've never looked back. That's I've never looked back, mostly because she looks back for me. Actually, come here, come here. I love Jeanette, and I'm a little protective of her. But you know, come. Whoa! That one came out of nowhere. Uh, this is something I'm in for the long road, literally. I love, I love her. I'm in love. This is a boy, this is a boy in love. Jeanette, I'm done with the car shows, you know? I'm done just browsing, I'm done with rentals, I'm done with, you know, I'm just, I'm done with that. So how do you monetize that? Well, well, you know, Prius is, is Toyota. To Toyota has been our largest sponsor, and they've they've doubled their money each of the three years they've advertised on Current. And in part, it's because of the power of these viewer-created ads. So the the economic proposition for Toyota is pretty attractive. You know, instead of spending what is on average a million dollars to just produce a 30-second commercial, which they then go buy time on a bunch of networks to air. Um, we, through the system that we've created, source incredible content creators like the young man who produced that commercial. It's all part of the sponsorship package. They pay nothing to produce that commercial. We pay the content creator. If they want to use that spot elsewhere, they have to pay the content creator more to take it off current, and many of our sponsors do just that. But, you know, these are multi-million dollar sponsorship packages many, we have with each of these How many packages like that do you have? Well, I'm not going to tell you our revenue But you have number, more than one. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. We've had, and, and by the way, advertisers who start with us and are willing to experiment with viewer-created ads all end up moving most of their inventory to the viewer-created ads, not to the stuff they've already produced. And these are advertisers like Sony and Toyota and T-Mobile and uh, L'Oreal and HP and many others. Another reason for advertising agencies to sweat. Well, we, we try to let them in on the action and take credit for the big ideas as long as we get the sponsorship. Evan, speaking mm -hmm. about sweat, um, in the middle of the night when you wake up, uh, what's your nightmare for Twitter? What, what worries you most? Well, thankfully I'm not waking up in the middle of the night as much lately, but we, it's still very early for Twitter. I mean, we, we get a lot of attention for, for the stage we're at as a company. I think people are excited about the idea and see the potential, but we have yet to realize most of that potential. I and mean, we, we are not at, at the level of a Facebook or MySpace and well-established and mainstream yet. And so it's all about execution now. And we have to, you know, there's a million worries on a daily basis about a particular feature or a particular technical problem and, and you know, people problems and everything else that someone has if they're trying to but build But no company. overriding um, I'm feeling pretty good right now. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. There's not, there's not one, one worry that's overshadowing all the others. Would you feel his pulse? <laughs> well, see, I was, gonna, I was hoping you'd ask me because I was going to say, I'm older than Evan, so I worry a lot more than he does. But, um, you know, for, for us, I think, you know, our, our competitive advantage will be to continue to stay at the leading edge of innovation. And, and so that's a process. That's not a question of your success last month with something that was innovative. It was how do you continue to, to how, do you, how do you build internally, you know, innovation processes that assure that you're going to stay out at that leading edge. And I think that's very, very hard to do. So we have to, we have to attract the very best talent and who share our passion about, about Current's mission. Uh, and we've got to continually innovate with, uh, with partners uh, uh, where we can, uh, but on content creation fronts, technology fronts, and again, the, the users in control. We've got to provide that content to users on the platforms that they want to receive it, and we've got to continue to, uh, to, to envision more and more ways uh, to give them control and power. Where we're headed now, for example, Ken, is we're going to be launching in the first quarter uh, what we call cross-platform channels, and these are going to be many of them co-branded with partners, uh, and they'll they'll reside in a you know there'll be a a, a, a movie channel on current.com uh, with a major co-branded partner that will draw drive lots of promotion, lots of engagement, lots of participation, and then it'll be paired and with a with a movie review show once a week on Current TV, which will be very much user influence as to what its content is creating a cross-platform experience that is not duplicative, but that it is additive, that's mutually reinforcing and, and re-enriching. A lot of what's going on in the old media world today is about how do we move TV to people's laptops. You know, that's interesting, but it's not a big idea. If, you, if you're not in a room with a TV, so you can watch Desperate Housewives on your laptop. You know, okay. But what we see is the really big part of the future is to take the magic of the internet, which really is magical, the interactivity, the empowerment, uh, the participation, engagement, and move that magic to, the, to TV. And so that's what we've been trying to do. And again, we're, we're only as good as our, as our next innovation that keeps us out front. Questions, audience, if you, anyone have any questions or, yes, just step to the mic, please. Hi, um, I have a question and I guess I'm interested in Ken's answer to it as, as well as the, the, the new model for, for TV news, do, do you see the notion of a program news show at 8 p.m., the nightly news, uh, surviving, Ken? Or do you see it you know, moving to the internet entirely? And if so, do you think there's enough revenue to produce the news uh, that exists on places like CNN and MSNBC if it's web only? I mean, do you think the 6 o'clock nightly news is going to disappear? And if so, how long and, and what? Uh, and what economic model, you know, is there an economic model to support TV journalism in that way? Um, I, I, just quickly, I, I think that the 6.30 news, it's someplace it's 6, sometimes, someplace it's 5.30, is probably a, a dinosaur at some point. Um, the problem, the reason they, a reason they keep it on is it becomes the brand for the entire network, and it's one that the local stations depend on. 
So it, it, it serves other economic purposes for the networks to do that. There'll never be an eight o'clock news the way there is, say, in, in, in some other countries because they can't make enough money unless the audience shrinks so much and the cost of producing the news is so cheap that it would make economic sense to do that. But I, I think network news, they're moving to, to cable networks, which is the advantage that NBC has today because they have two cable networks. Did you want to? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, broadcast news is a, is, is a dinosaur, and, 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 and it, it brought that upon itself. It is an incredibly tired format. It is, there's been no innovation on that format in 40 years. I grew up with Walter Con Cronkite being the anchor on CBS Evening News, and, you know, and basically nothing's changed except his tagline. He ended every show, Ken, you'll remember, by saying, and that's the way it is, folks, September 22, 1974. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Well, nothing's changed except they don't use that tagline. I mean, that's still what Brokaw does, and that's still what they And if you ask my sons, who are both in their 20s, to, re to respond to some notion that every night someone's going to tell you, and that's the way it is, I mean, that's like speaking Greek to them. That's the way, that's the only way it is. There aren't any other ways there are. I mean, it's just not, it is not a way that a young adult generation is willing to receive information, and yet there's been no innovation off of that format in 40 years. Next question. Um, I'm sorry. In a world of user-generated content being the primary source of that of content, um, how do you deal with truth? Before, with media brands, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, whether you agree with the content or not, there was some credibility in the brand, and you had some, at least, comfort that the content coming from them were, was truthful. Um, in a world of user-generated content, how do you think about truth? Yeah, well, first as an aside, uh, we in three and a half years uh, have had no problems with that whatsoever, and none of the places you've mentioned in the last three and a half years can say that. But here's what's the more important substantive answer. It's, it's, what's important is how you present the information you're presenting. If it's user-generated content, we make sure you know that's what it is, and it is what it purports to be. If it is a person telling that person's story, that's what it's purported to be. And on current, we'll always follow that with, that's so-and-so's viewpoint. And if yours is different, we hope you'll submit you know, your, your, your point of view to current as well, either at current.com or for, for current TV in whatever media format you want to submit it, because we have platforms that will accommodate it. So we don't say this is truth. We say this is Ken Oletta's view of what's happening on the Gaza Strip today. Now, if it's one of our journalists, if it's part of our Vanguard journalist team, then we try to apply the highest standards of, of, of journalism that, that we can. Uh, we've won, by the way, so far, almost every award that's out there, including recently won the Livingston Award, the most prestigious award for, for news journalism, awarded to journalists 35 years and, and younger. And one of our journalists won that award. And, but, you know, we have the same risks, the same challenges of, of making sure with fact-checking and verification and what have you. So again, it, if it's our journalism, we're willing to be held to the highest possible standards, and we've been proud of what we've been able to do so far. If it's user-generated, we make sure you know that's what it is. And we want you to interpret it as that person's point of view. And we think there's enormous power in recreating a marketplace of ideas where the best points of view will be responded to. And it's our community that's the fact checker. When there's something that people believe that's just not right, the community responds in a way that's far more credible than anything else that you see with all the respectable journalistic enterprises you mentioned. There's not quite the same feedback loop, and it certainly isn't in real time as it is at current. Did you want to respond? I, uh, well, uh, Joel kind of ended with the point that I wanted to make, because I've been answering this question for 10 years, again, with regards to blogging. And just if you look at the internet, is, there, is it easier or harder to get access to the truth than it was before? I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer in my mind. Yes. Jonathan Laventhal, Imagination. The rise of all the user-generated content that you're describing has um, been going at a fantastic pace for, for quite a while, as we've all noticed. Could you step, maybe step back or talk a little louder? It's, it's, it's muffled. Yeah, okay, it is. Um, the rise of the user-generated content over the recent time has been spectacular. The, the thing that would keep me awake at night in terror is, are we just entering a kind of new and improved radio phone-in era where we'll plateau in some way, 
or do you think we're going to continue after that and actually get the, some kind of massive increase in the way that perhaps Wikipedia has achieved for uh, their space? Well, I don't know. Um, you know, that's, that's all going to depend on, on the formats, the environments, how compelling and useful the information is that's being provided, how well you know, the public responds to it and engages with it. It's why we continue to try to be as responsive as we can to what we're learning from our users and, and from our viewers. Um, uh, I, I, have, I have high hopes, but you know, these things, you know, develop in, in um, uh, in unpredictable ways, and that's again why constant innovation is important. Um, you, you know, and each of these developments that have become phenomenon uh, have different characteristics. You know, you take YouTube. I mean, YouTube's a phenomenon, uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, on that long tail, you know, most of what's submitted to YouTube is way down deep in the long tail. It's Aunt Tilly's 90th birthday party. It's my pet cat. And you know, if you missed your own Aunt Tilly's 90th birthday party, you're going to be one of the seven people that watch that video. But it's a hell of a service. It's a hell of a platform. Evan, you want to finish up because we're getting the we're over. I had more on YouTube, but <laughs> uh, I, do. I don't have anything to add to that. Thank you, and thank our panelists.